today we've been joined by a very special guest he represented sri lanka in their first ever test match he's also the first centurion for sri lanka in test history and he's also the first person to score a test century at the home of cricket the lord's cricket ground a top class cricketer a match referee once an administrator more of all he's a successful businessman he's done other than siddhat vettamuni thank you very much mr siddhat for accepting my invitation to feature on the show today Pleasure to be here. 1999, you were made as chairman of the selectors. Sri Lanka were going through a transition period. Sanat Jayasuriya was made as a captain. Uh, it was a kind of a gamble between him and Roshan Mahanam. Uh, was kind of a leader at that time. Paid off really well. Sri Lanka had a wonderful run in terms of both ODIs and uh, test matches. Uh, again in 2015, you were made as the chairman of the interim committee of Sri Lanka cricket. Mahila Jawadana had already retired. Kumar Sangakkara has already made up his mind to retire from Test cricket and one day cricket as well. What was your plan in terms of helping Sri Lanka out during the transition period after 2015? Okay, so going back to that period where I was chairing the interim committee, it was a very short period, unfortunately. It was too short. For example, the one thing that we were really keen on getting going was building those indoor facilities, uh, and a swimming pool for our players to uh, work with, uh, which had been lacking for years and years and years. To date, we don't have a proper indoor facility at uh, Kataram as far as I know. And it was, you know, getting up. The columns are up, the foundations are ready, and we left and everything was just abandoned. And that's been the story of Sri Lanka cricket. You know, interim committees come, they do something, they try to get things going, and then they are sent home. And then there's an appointed body which carries on the same way they have carried on for donkey's years. And, and that's why we are in the situation we are in today. We have not kept pace with the changes. We have not realized that other countries are going ahead. And... Uh, you just stagnated and you see the results on the cricket field. You spoke about improving the infrastructure facilities during a short period of time. From a cricketing perspective, in terms of improving the quality of cricket that we are playing at the international level, what measures that you had in your mind to kind of implement? You see, what we wanted to do was actually a pretty basic thing which is there in every other country, you know. In fact, I was so shocked. I was in Oman last year and I saw the new facility that Oman has got as an Indo facility. They have seven wickets. Our own Dulip Mendes is in charge of that and running that. Seven fabulous uh, Indo nets with different playing conditions. And in a country like Sri Lanka, when you have so much rain, you need those facilities to get our players to practice, play, groove in their game. And if you don't have those basic things, how do you compete with other countries? It's just not possible, you know. So I don't blame the players for where we are. It's really our administration over the years that have just not bothered about what needs to be done. They have just bothered about wanting to get there. That's it. What you meant to say is that let's assume if Sri Lanka is going to tour Australia, then you would have wickets such in Australia will be prepared in Sri Lanka, so our players would be accust accustomed in terms of playing in those wickets, so they'll be adapting easily Absolutely. when they get there. Absolutely. You see, in, in Oman, I saw these wickets. You know, they have, a, they have a track which they say is more like a Perth wicket, and then they have another wicket where the ball turns square. So they have different, different conditions. And mind you, these are very basic things now in any country. But Sri Lanka, we are still not ready. You can go and see, you know, I, I feel sad. If you walk into Kataram, you will see this. It's like an old uh, neglected relic of some sort. Foundations are there, but nothing has been done. If you're saying these are basic things and can be done, and if Oman could do a test cricket playing nation as us, we should be able to do those things kind of as well. What is stopping? I guess it's the, the petty-mindedness of some people and the politicking that goes on, you know. The priorities are different. The most important thing is you need to know your priorities when you're running our cricket. Today, one of the most important things is to have a good first-class tournament with very few teams. 
we don't have that we have 24 first class teams i am told and that is a joke you know i'm not joking i think if i practice for a week and put on my pads with some of those teams maybe i can still score runs that is the level of our cricket we don't realize to compete with other countries you got to get to that same level and that has to be done but nobody will have the courage i can assure you nobody in our current system of uh, governance will have the courage to say i'm bringing down the first class teams to 10 or 8 nobody will why because they'll lose the votes they fear the voting system and that is the crux of the matter till we change our constitution and this terrible voting system which is full of politics we will not progress i can assure you if my math is right 24 teams means about 260 odd players competing and you're trying to choose 11 players it's ridiculous it's ridiculous and we need a good four day tournament you see if you take just the last two games we couldn't last five days that's because and i don't blame the players they are not used to playing the four day game the five day game you see you need a certain skill and a level of patience a, a know-how which can take you through to five days and some of our guys just don't have that they don't have the patience they don't have the technique even without the technique if you have played a lot of four day cricket good cricket then you will adapt and you know play the game the way you should but our guys can't so whom do you blame i just blame the administration which we have had not the interim committees because the interim committees have not had a chance to do anything you know you i've been in believe it or not eight interim committees eight interim committees since 2000 and every time we try to do something every time we try to implement something you can be assured as soon as we leave that is completely broken down so that's the state of our cricket uh, you spoke about the constitution now in 2015 when we were chairing the interim committee you almost came close to implementing a new constitution you prepared a concept paper prime minister was involved and the sports minister was supportive of that initiative but somewhere around the corner something fell apart what happened actually that, that was really sad. sad actually correction the sports minister was not supportive uh, he didn't do anything about it the prime minister was supportive uh, the icc was supportive the icc actually informed the prime minister that they're happy for us to continue and change the constitution that they will help us in any way technical or whatever and we were told to go ahead and do the change but don't ask me what happened uh, didn't materialize uh, can you briefly explain what were the contents of that concept paper yeah you see one of the main things was there was a governance like a nine member board not 22 members or something what we had was a nine member board which had professionals in it you know a professional finance guy a legal guy three cricketers i think three test cricketers were in that i'm just giving you a rough outline but we brought the voter uh, numbers down from 147 to 50 odd i really think it should be brought down even lower but that was only a concept paper and then there was there were checks and balances there was a governing body which was there to uh, either approve or disprove any expenditure over a certain level so that there was a check and balance you know and in that committee also there were professionals we needed a professional ceo to run the thing and uh, it was very good I, you know i've sent it to the icc guys they were happy with it and uh, we could have developed that a lot further and come up with something which was good for our country um, as you know other countries have uh, very few votes to pick the board we in sri lanka have 147 with 22 million people and india 1.3 billion people 46 votes. 46 votes and even they have been told to try and reduce it to 30. Uh, i think australia has six or seven new zealand five south africa eight so it's ridiculous you know but i have been talking this for years and years and years nothing happens so 
you know, but we live in hope. Let's hope something will happen before too long. You know, uh, the current sports minister is a sportsman himself. So I'm hoping that he will uh, take the bull by the horns and do something. It's uh, very crystal clear what needs to be done. 22 million people are supporting Sri Lanka cricket. Sri Lanka cricket is something that kind of, you know, got us to the world map. Now, if we know what we need to do, and if we've been just dwelling upon the old stories for the last six years and seeing our cricket falling apart, there should be some, some type of influence from somewhere. But why do you think, you know, these things are going wrong? As I said, it's the system we have got used to. You see, the guys who are there are very familiar and very comfortable with this voting system. You know, I'll give you a solid example, which to me is a joke. There are clubs that don't play cricket at all, but they have the same number of votes as, say, an SSC and CCCs. And you wonder why? And nobody is changing it. There are clubs that have votes, but they don't play cricket. So what benefit do they get from the administration and what benefit does the administration get from these voters? That's the question we have to ask. So they're not bothered about changing this constitution and they fear change. They don't want to change it because they fear. They're comfortable in this system, you know, 147 votes. It's like a national election where you got to go politicking with all these guys who hold all these votes in district, provinces, you name it, you know. So, till that is set aside and we get a good constitution, manageable with a very few number of votes, we are going to be in this rut, believe me. During one of our programs, telecasted on our sister channel, Satana, we had uh, Arjuna Ranathunga, Sanat Jayasuri, Avishka Gunavadana and uh, Bandula Varnapura taking part and they spoke about what we can do to improve Sri Lanka cricket and uh, the suggestion that they gave was interim committee and uh, the obstacle that people are talking about is that the ICC does not like interim committee operating cricket in Sri Lanka but Arjuna Ranatunga came back and said Ar ICC does not think in that way if we tell ICC look we are trying to change the system we are trying to improve they will be happily accept, happy to accept you know our proposals is that true? Absolutely well when I was the chairman of the interim committee they wrote and said let the interim committee continue make the changes and they gave us a time period you know I can't remember six months or one year and they said they will support us in any way we want so it's wrong what is not good is just to have interim committees as a stopgap to um, sort out things and then give it back uh, to the board that is elected and that has not helped us because we have all been in interim committees and you come you do something you save money you try and improve things and as soon as you go back to square one They'll dismantle everything you did. Like, you know, there is solid proof. You should go to Kettaram and film it. That's what you can see. How disruptive and destructive people can be of what you do for the sake of the game. Now, you spoke about the financial aspect of the game. Now, when you took over the job as the chairman of the interim committee in 2015, there were two overdrafts, I believe. 200 million rupees and another 7 million US dollars with the uh, Bank of Ceylon, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, when you left the job in December 31st, I believe, in 2015, there was a surplus of 100 million. 100 or 200 million, if I can remember right. Yeah, yeah. No, it was nothing, nothing special. You know, it was just being sensible, cutting down cost, trying to save whatever we could, and cutting out the waste. And as an interim committee, we don't need to waste money doling out money to clubs and supporters and provinces and districts. You don't, you don't need to do all that. You spend money where you need to spend. So that was easy. That was easy. But what I'm so sad about is, A, we had a great opportunity to get our indoor facility and pool ready for our cricketers, which would have been so useful over the years. Two was when the ICC gave us a chance to make the change, we didn't take it. 
we wouldn't have waited for about six years to see everything falling apart had we made that change in 2015, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even now, I, I think it's, you just need to make the right decisions and you can turn this around, you know, because the one good thing is we yet have talent. We have youngsters coming through who are good players, you know, give them the right opportunity and nurture them through the formative years correctly and we will start producing some very good players, I believe. Based on the topic of the concept paper that you produced in 2015, my understanding is that the main focal point of the constitution that needs to be changed is to reduce the number of votes so you get good people managing cricket in Sri Lanka. That is the most important thing, I believe. Absolutely. People who will not worry about whether they are going to win an election or whether they are going to lose. Right now, we need somebody who will make the call and say, look, this is the cricket we need to play. And till we do that, I'll tell you, we're going to struggle. And every year, other countries like Bangladesh, even Ireland, all those guys are getting ahead, getting ahead. They're moving ahead. And it's so sad. It's just a sad state of affairs. Going back to the point that you made about Oman cricket, they have seven different types of pitches. Uh, based on your understanding, I put myself into the shoes of a fan, Sri Lankan fan. I'm asking how much does it cost for us to prepare a wicket which is similar in Australia? Not a lot, you know. You, we have good wickets at Katarama, which again, I was involved when we did that. Uh, we had a whole lot of wickets, about 14 wickets, and the idea was to have different sort of wickets depending on which country we were going to play. All that can be done, you know, what it needs is the right thinking, the right thinking and the right planning. But this indoor facility, you could use year round. You could do your training there, you could bring in teams, junior teams, uh, and expose them to different conditions. And just the other day, I think I saw a facility now in the USA, uh, an indoor facility. Looks absolutely stunning. But what has Sri Lanka got? What can we show as even one decent indoor facility? None. None. And there's no shortage in terms of money that we have as Absolutely well? Absolutely not. It wasn't going to cost a fortune, you know. Uh, let's talk about uh, the pre-test cricket era now. Uh, you, were, you played in the first ever test match that Sri Lanka ever played against England. Uh, the greats of the pre-test era, Anurot Tenakon, people like Michael Tissera, current generation, uh, do not know about them basically. Uh, the recent thing that I can recall is about the Sir Garfield Sobers and Michael Tissera trophy, which has been played between Sri Lanka and West Indies. Sri Lanka is going to tour West Indies. You were 26 when you made your debut for Sri Lanka in 1982. What are your memories about them? Can you kind of reminisce what type of players these guys are? The players like Michael Tissera and Anur oh, Tendakon. Michael and Anur were fantastic players. They were ambassadors to the game. Um, Michael Tissera, you know, he was my idol. I, I just thought he carried himself perfectly, you know. Absolute gentleman lovely to play with or against. He was a fantastic cricketer, bold and battered. He was the most underrated uh, leg spinner, I thought, uh, we had. He was a very, very useful leg spinner, lovely batsman, and they would have done wonders. Anura Tennakon would have been a run machine, you know. He was just phenomenal as a batsman, absolutely phenomenal. He was like a wall. Once he got in, you couldn't get him out. And I'll tell you, he would have done well in any era. All of them would have done. And we are just talking about two players. There were so many super players in that pre-test era. You know, uh, I, was, I was lucky. I played half my cricket in the pre-test era from 77 to 81 and then after. But there were so many who were very unfortunate, you know. My elder brother was unfortunate, uh, Sunil, another lovely player. So many, you know, just unbelievable. Um, we had fantastic bowlers like Tony Opata, Ajit Disil. They played mainly in the pre-test era. So, fantastic players they were. Uh, talking about 1981, back again, Sri Lanka gained test status. Uh, an instrumental figure was uh, the president of Sri Lanka, uh, back in the days, Board of Control for Cricket in Sri Lanka, Gavini Disanayaka. 
I was not born when Sri Lanka gained test status, but uh, I when I search about it, I see that uh, video of uh, Mr. Late Gavin Dissanayake coming down to Sri Lanka after gaining test status. It was a wonderful moment for Sri Lankans. Uh, can you briefly explain about the contribution that he made towards Sri Lanka gaining test status? Yeah, um, you know that that period I still remember, and it was a very special period. Uh, one person who was obviously very very uh, instrumental was Mr. Gamani Disanaga, but the other person who who is in my opinion an unsung hero was Mr. Rajamahendran, who was the vice president. You see, Mr. Rajamahendran, I think, employed maybe over 120 test cricketers, and I was one. I started my working life uh, in 1976, 77, with the Maharaj organization, and I was sent to England by him uh, just to play cricket. And I wasn't the only person who benefited by that. So many cricketers came through that uh, process of mercantile cricket. And he was the giant in uh, promoting uh, mercantile cricket. Combine him with Mr. Gamini Disanayaka, you know, they were a fantastic um, president and vice president to get us where we got to. And I'll never forget, we were in Yorkshire playing uh, Yorkshire, I think, at the Grovena house when we were first told that we've got uh, test status. And we were just overjoyed, you know, because at that time, <coughs> our dream was maybe just to say, play a test match, you know, play a test match, <laughs> nothing else, play a test match. That was what we aspired to. Uh, and uh, Mr. Gamini Disanaka and uh, Raja Mahendran were the prime, prime movers in getting us that. And uh, I think, you know, we, we don't recognize it enough. We don't recognize it enough. One lasting memory of uh, that combination, Mr. Late Gavani Disanayaka and Mr. Raja Mahendra, about them involving in getting Sri Lanka to that level. Everything they did, you see. I, I remember before we went to England, about five of us were taken to England by Mr. Raja Mahendra and kept in a home there so that we could practice. And I remember playing a game for MCC uh, as an invitation, you know, invitee, and I got 100. We had that kind of support when the board at that time just could not afford to spend money on uh, our cricket. We just didn't have it. So it was their personal uh, time and effort that um, gave us all the support, you know. And I think we had uh, Mr. Ted Dexter who came and spoke to us a couple of times and, and then we had a coach called Don Smith who the board had taken as, an, uh, as a coach during our tour. So all that was done in a very difficult period but with great sacrifice and uh, hats off to the late Kamini Dasanayaka and Mr. Raja Mahendran. Uh, you spoke about uh, Mr. Raja Mahendran took, helped five players to go to England and practice who are the five players? Yourself? If I can remember right, it was Ranjan, me, Roshan, um, Ashanta. I, I can't remember. It was five of us anyway. A and it was fantastic because we went to Lords. We, we were practicing in the Indo facility there. And then I remember we were given this practice game where they invited us to play for. Um, so, you know, all that was done because they had that great love for the game. You know, it was a sacrifice on their part, not what we see in, uh, today where people get to these places where they want to gain something by it. So there was huge sacrifice on their part. In 1984, before uh, when you toured England, when you were about to play a test match at Lords, uh, Ted Dexter, a former England batsman, had played about 60 matches, average is 47. He was being appointed as a professional advisor and uh, Mr. Raja Mahindran had played a pivotal role in terms of making that particular appointment. What type of knowledge did you gain prior to playing your first match in England? Having guys like that talk to you, encourage you, makes a huge difference, you know. Because you go there as somebody who is very new in the game, new in test cricket and you go to the mecca of cricket and you are under uh, pressure, you know, you feel the pressure when you walk into that huge uh, institution, you feel the pressure. So, 
these guys helped you to cope and ha handle the situation the best you can. I've seen on a previous interview that you have spoken. Uh, Mr. Late Gamini Disanayaka had given a speech in 1984 at the historic Lord's Cricket Grounds. Yes, that was just an unforgettable speech. I always said, you know, that inspired us um, to walk in there next day feeling, feeling good. Um, I'll never forget after he spoke, the chairman of TCCB, I think then, was the chairman of uh, British Airways. And his first, his first words were, how does one follow Mr. Gamini Disanayaga? You know, it was such a beautiful uh, speech, you know. It had everything you can ask for in a speech. There was humor, there was history, um, there was so much in it. It was just a brilliant speech. I wish we had somebody had recorded it. Yes, I was about to come to that point. I, we are not privileged enough to listen to those kind of speeches nowadays. Uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but do you remember any contents that he had spoken, what inspired you? No, I remember. What I remember was, you know, from out of the blues, he was bringing fabulous examples. I remember, he, I think his talk of Sir Gary Sobers, who had been with us in 83, little, little anecdotes and the way he constructed that whole speech and delivered it to perfection. It was just brilliant. Wonderful. Now, you had the privilege of playing Sri Lanka's first ever test match and uh, the selection committee, whoever who were in the selection committee did not uh, make the wrong call. You were the first test centurion for Sri Lanka and first player to score a century at the home of cricket, the Lord's Cricket Ground. What better place to do that? Can you recall the memories uh, about you getting the call up for Sri Lanka? Yeah, you see, by the time we came to 81, 80, that period, I was getting fairly established in the team because I started in 77. And then I was dropped for that 79 World Cup, I remember, where my brother went. And then again, I started playing. So, I didn't find it uh, a huge surprise to be selected because I thought I was good, definitely going to be there. But playing the first test match was uh, an experience, you know, because you've never played five days of cricket. And, and I remember, um, I think they, somebody told me that they had this strategy when we went into bat and we were on top, I think, for three days. When we went into bat, we found the field was unusual. They had the guys catching, nobody in between and some guys on the line. And I still recan, can't recall who said this, but they said their strategy was these guys are either going to block or hit. They won't have the capacity to work the ones and twos because their mindset will be different. And we actually got caught to that, you know, we played into their hands. But that goes back to the point I said, we were not familiar with five-day cricket. And we, we, we lasted four days. But at least, you know, we played good cricket, we looked good. Um, people had hope. That was the key. I read an article published by, written by rather, Prema Sara Appa Singh, a renowned cricket commentator. Uh, one black mark in the cricket history of Sri Lanka that uh, cannot be erased was the rebel tour in 1982. South Africa was uh, taken out of the Commonwealth nations due to their cruel policies. Uh, but despite that, a group had toured South Africa in 1982. Were you invited? Yes, I was. I was invited for that, but I, I was never keen to go on it. Uh, my brother was invited too, but we didn't. You know, when I look back, uh, what I feel very sorry is uh, that there were a lot of players who went, but who really didn't even know what South Africa was. Uh, some of them didn't know anything about South Africa. They were just, oh, look, we're going on this tour and this is the money available. And they thought, why not? At the end of the day, we were not paid anything to play cricket in those days. So, you know, most of the time we were out of pocket. So, some of those guys went without knowing what they were going into. So, uh, that, that was really sad. And we lost a few good players. We lost a few good players. Talking about uh, nowadays, uh, sledging is extremely prevalent, courtesy of the stomp mics. Back in the days, did Sri Lanka, was Sri Lanka involved in sledging? 
or you were the receiving hand. Oh, the sledging in our days was much worse because there was no stump mic. You see, now uh, I heard uh, one of our players just talking over the mic. They'll talk with very decent language and they'll kid each other a little. But in our time, it was not that, you know. I'll never forget the first ball I faced off Rodney Hogg, I think it was. Uh, he came right up to me and I had attempted to hook the ball was in the keeper's hand and he came right up to me that distance staring at me and he just gave me a barrage of uh, terrible language which I can't repeat and that was normal uh, we were always considered the underdog newcomers in the game we had plenty of it but didn't bother us too much you know I just smiled at him so uh, it was part of the game some guys took it a little beyond what they should uh, so the changes that came in the game were good where you, you had to do away with sledging which was bad now what you hear on television is harmless you know uh, i heard one of our players uh, or oh, the famous sangha talking to pollock that's fine you know a little bit of fun <coughs> not offensive and as long as you're not offensive it doesn't matter you know did you ever want to give it back you know, I found whenever I got sledged, I was batting and I didn't want to lose focus. So if you start getting into a verbal battle, you just lose your concentration. So that was not worth it. <coughs> but it uh, didn't bother me for sure. Now, your century at the Lord's Cricket Grounds, 190 runs. Uh, one last mem lasting memory from that knock. I've heard about uh, the protests that took place uh, and uh, you kind of, it helped you to cool your mind down so you could concentrate yes, yes. anything uh, apart from was, that? Uh, that was certainly useful, did help me to calm my nerves and uh, I, something that was really touching was uh, Moshin Khan had got a double hundred at Lord's earlier and he was in, he was playing in uh, Manchester and I remember he called me before the match and said, you got to score runs, I'm going to call you at lunch. He called me at every break and kept talking to me, which is lovely, you know, coming from a Pakistani uh, friend. Uh, that was lovely. And I had a friend of mine who had sent me a card. I better not mention his name. And uh, it said, uh, you know, relax, this is just only a game of cricket. And that helped me to relax. So, of course, I had a good tour, that tour before the... Uh, the test match I had a very good build up so I was fairly confident but you know you have the nerves when you go to and we were very unfortunate in our time because we had a lot of these one off games which don't help because you play one match and if you do badly in that match your whole tour has been bad uh, and there were a lot of players who would have had that problem you know they did, they did well but didn't do well in that particular match. So that was something that brought upon a lot of stress to players because you, you go on something and you say, okay, you got one test match, you got to do something. And then in that time, in our early years, we had a lot of those sort of short, short tours. At this point of time, the players have been pressurized through the social media. Each and every one who has a social media account is a critic whenever, who does, uh, whenever a player who whenever a player does not perform well. Uh, back in the days, I would say newspapers. And obviously you would have had the same kind of pressure as well. How did you kind of overcome those obstacles? You know, what went in the newspapers never bothered us. And I must say, people were generally pretty decent about things. And this social media wasn't there. So we didn't have the, I feel sorry for the current players because they have to go through a lot of these issues. We didn't have that. You know, we just had the newspapers uh, reporting and they were very decent about it most of the time you know okay they may be critical of how we played but that was okay that was okay is it right players using social media at a tough time like this obviously seeing those you know nasty articles written about you the memes and everything it puts you down you know i honestly wouldn't know because i am not on any of those things uh, so i wouldn't know but i guess where if there are good things being said, it's it's good. But when things go bad, it must be not that Obviously you great. Keep thinking about it and possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you need to have the players focusing on their game and not thinking too much about that kind of thing. 
One final question, Mr. Siddharth, is that uh, you spoke about priorities. What should be Sri Lanka cricket's priority in terms of improving the game that we love? Uh, if I ask you to name maybe three or five things, what should we be looking at in terms of improving Sri Lanka cricket? What would you name? Simple. First and foremost is change the constitution. Completely revamp the board with a new constitution, a more professionalized body running cricket. Two, immediately get our domestic first class tournament to be worthy of first class status. Without that, we cannot progress. I think if you do those two, the rest will fall into place. You know, the rest will fall into place. But changing the constitution and revamping our board completely, only, uh, you know, it has to come from the top. Uh, there couldn't be any better person than the current sports minister, Honorable Namal Rajapaksa, to do this because he got the support of the prime minister. So to the president. Absolutely. And one other advantage, even above those, because I have spoken to him uh, at a meeting, he has himself been a, uh, a national sportsman. You know, he, he's been a sportsman at the top. He knows what it is. Because I remember uh, in one discussion, we were talking about votes for provinces and he said something very useful which opened my eyes, which is, he said, why do we give every province the same number of votes when Colombo, I think he was referring to rugby, when Colombo and Candy have most of the clubs. So why give others all these votes when they're doing nothing? And I think it applies to cricket too. So yes, there's a good chance that he can do something. I guess the only person who could make a change in the Sri Lanka cricket at this point of time is Honorable Sports Minister Namal Rajapak. So that's what the expectation of the country to see cricket grow as a sport in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Mr. Siddharth, for accepting my invitation to feature on this show. It was an indeed insightful uh, interview. Thank you very much once again. Thanks.